Chers collègues, chers étudiants, mesdames et messieurs, dear alumni et dear friends, bienvenue à tous et à toutes à la séance de rentrée académique de l'Institut d'études européennes de l'Université libre de Bruxelles 2020-2021. My name is Ramon Akoman, the president of the Institute for European Studies, together with Vice President Emmanuel Bribosia and Nicola Persfuren, director. I am delighted to welcome you to the opening of the academic year in European Studies. In normal times, the opening of the academic year marks an important moment as it brings together our new students, former students, alumni, as well as our academic community members of the three partner faculties, the Faculty of Philosophy and Social Sciences, the Faculty of Law and Criminology, and Solvay Brussels School of Economics and Management. Despite the pandemic and the confinements, we wanted to maintain our traditional opening, which is a moment of dialogue, but also a moment of reflection on important questions for us as scholars and citizens. As we all know, Ten years ago, the European Union was facing one of its biggest crises, the crisis of the euro. Today, the EU is facing another one, which is the global health crisis. Ten years ago, many argued that the survival of the European Union was at stake. The scholars of the Institute have studied the responses given by EU institutional actors in order to save the euro from different perspectives, from different through the lenses of different disciplines. Uh, you remember that at the beginning of uh, the eurozone crisis, the economic governance of the EU was reshaped, structural reforms were implemented, bound to have a profound impact on the member states. The rules of the Stability and Growth Pact were strengthened, at least in the first years of the crisis, to allow more flexibility once the crisis started to cool down, but also once it became uh, clear that austerity was no longer an option. Our community of scholars has devoted considerable attention to this decade of crisis. Being an interdisciplinary research institute, political scientists have devoted attention to the legitimacy question with an eye on contestation on the social dimension of the crisis. Our colleagues, historians, devoted more attention to the uh, concept of crisis and the crisis as a driver of change in the integration process. And of course, our colleagues, lawyers, have scrutinized the compatibility between the political solutions adopting, adopted during the crisis with the legal framework uh, of the uh, EU. And last but not least, our colleagues economists focus more on the, on the tools and the solutions adopted in order to strengthen the economic governance of the EU, as well as the fiscal and budgetary policies of uh, the EU member states. Regardless of the perspectives, all the eyes fixed the European Central Bank, in particular after the declaration of then President Mario Draghi announcing that the bank will do whatever it takes to save the euro and the president added and that will be enough. Today, Is the sound correct? Yes. The global spread of the COVID-19 pandemic and its devastating social economic impact represent a considerable challenge for nation state and the EU. In March this year, the Commission proposed the unprecedented suspension of EU's fiscal rules. In March, too, the President of the European Central Bank's Governing Council announced a new pandemic emergency purchase program with an envelope of 750 billion, in addition to the 120 billion decided earlier. In May, the German Constitutional Court, who has always challenged the integration through law, ruled that the European Central Bank's decisions on the public sector purchase program exceeded EU competence, but the court, also stated that this decision does not concern the financial assistance measures adopted in the context of the current health crisis. Again, 
all the eyes are fixed on the European Central Bank, its leadership, accountability, legitimacy and actions. No, as then, the role of the European Central Bank in the European Union raises many questions. This evening, we are very privileged to welcome two guest speakers to go back to these questions with the necessary insight in an even more difficult context as the current health crisis is global. So let me introduce both our speakers. First, Peter Pat. He was executive board member of the European Central Bank and its chief economist from 2011 to 2019. In this capacity, he was responsible for preparing the monetary policy meetings and making the proposals for the policy decisions. Peter Pratt is also fellow Ecares Solvet School of Economics and Management at our university and was a former professor at the Institute for European Studies. Second, Antoine Vaucher is a CNRS research professor in political sociology and law at the Centre Européen de Sociologie et de Sciences Politiques de l'Université Paris 1 Sorbonne. Among many famous publications, he has recently published the Neoliberal Republic at Cornell University Press with Pierre France. Tonight, this will be organized as follows. First, Peter Pratt will have the floor for the next 15 minutes. His talk will be followed by Antoine Vaucher's reaction and questions to Peter Pratt. The dialogue will continue as we will open the floor and invite our guests to react to the questions addressed by the audience. Priority will be given to the questions received in advance. At the end, time permitting, we will collect some questions that we will receive in the chat box during the debate. Please use the chat box to communicate with us and raise your questions. And as a reminder, one hour and a half is the, the, the duration of the event. So, without further ado, Peter Pratt, you have the floor. Thank you and uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, I wanted to start by saying that I'm very grateful to the Institute of European Studies. Uh, I had the privilege to work and teach in the Institute. And, uh, you know, the uniqueness of the Institute was to bring together uh, people from, of course, different uh, countries, different cultures, but also uh, the multidisciplinarity, you know, uh, environment. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that when I was there, all the benefits I would have with the feedback, you know, and the discussions with colleagues and, and students from different disciplines. And uh, it's unique. Frankly, it's unique. And it's something uh, which all my life, you know, I, I'm thinking about that. Even if you don't realize, you know, because when you talk with people from, from other disciplines, you always get something. So, so thank you very much. I'm very grateful. The second is... Uh, preparing a little bit the intervention in 15 minutes. Uh, just before the COVID shock, we uh, had uh, the celebration of 20 years euro. And as been said just in the introduction, uh, at some point we were close to, you know, to collapse, you know, to, to implode maybe. And, uh, and uh, that led to a number of reflections. And uh, I think the, the question about Jean Monnet, you know, Europe will be forged in crisis, I must say, I was always, I think that you should always reflect about this uh, as citizens, you know, as academics and all that, because, you know, uh, you should prepare. Many of these things, you know, are predictable that there will be shocks. You know, now we have climate. I think this may be one of the occasions where you try to invest before it's too late. But I mean, I think it's late. But it's, uh, that, that's now in the priorities, you know, to look at the climate risk, you know, which has been considered as a sort of tail risk that you can push, you know, much further away. Uh, health is, a, is an example where, uh, you know, a number of scientists have warned about what could happen. And even, you know, if you watch TV, you will see a number of science fiction movies, which are not so different from what we have seen, you know, recently. 
uh, about the virus. And uh, now in terms of, and it was uh, financial stability. I was always, uh, as Mathias de Watripon knows, you know, I was always, you know, struck by the fact that you, you would open the financial system, liberalize the financial system, uh, international, with a relatively weak regulation and uh, more importantly, uh, not uh, much preparation for the what if, you know, uh, sort of extreme event would happen. That means a banking crisis. So the banking, the global financial crisis hit us, you know, and we were extremely unprepared. And unpreparedness, of course, leads, of course, to huge cost. And uh, you sort of have of non-linear dynamics. It could, you know, lead to very bad outcomes. Or you have a reaction à la Jean Monnet. That means that, you know, the society comes together and tries to bring, you know, a number of institutional changes, you know, and, and rebuild, you know, for the future. I always thought that prevention is better than uh, crisis management and reaction. But it's also true, as we have seen in COVID, you know, we were not very much prepared for that sort of shock. Uh, but, but at least the reaction was was pretty good, I must say, uh, to the shock. Now we will see in the future, uh, but the reaction has been good, as with the global financial crisis. The problem with the reactions we had, uh, and I have limited time, but the problem we had with the reaction we had, and I mentioned uh, that we came with uh, the ESM, for those who know the acronyms, the SSM, you know, the single supervisor. So we, the macro prudential framework was reinforced, you know, to deal with financial stability. But frankly, frankly, a number of these things that have been put in place are still incomplete and not being tested to a major crisis again. So I think the, the framework has improved very much as a, re, a reaction to the crisis, the financial crisis. But I think the framework is still incomplete and there are risk related to that. And the last miles, if I can say to to, to have a robust financial stability framework is still very difficult to get at the political level. So that's that's one of the observations. And there are many others I can do. <coughs> now, with the looking backwards, uh, it reminded me that I was very much involved, you know, uh, before the monetary union, long before the monetary union at the Institute of European Union, but also when I worked in the private sector. Uh, about the construction. And uh, the, the construction of the monetary union reflected very much, of course, the consensus you know, of the time. It means that basically, and it's very important in the present context, basically uh, that stabilization policy uh, should be the responsibility of the central bank. That's, uh, and I would say, exclusively from the central bank. So the role of the government in stabilization policy would, uh, would be minimal, basically related to what we call automatic stabilizers. That means, for example, if the, the economy is a shock recession, people will pay lesser taxes and get some transfer from the, from the budget, and that would smoothen the shock you know, on the economy, on the society in general. So the automatic stabilizers were accepted, but discretionary policies for, from the side of the fiscal authorities were seen with a lot of suspicion. And, uh, and so stabilization policy basically, except with some exceptions, but basically should be given to the central bank and to an independent authority, which would be, uh, you know, central bankers with a very strong uh, contract, uh, a mandate, you know, well-defined mandate, and having the tools, the tools to reach, of course, the objective. The mandate was, of course, uh, price stability, and also to the extent that price stability is being achieved, you can support the other elements of economic policy. You can support, but uh, the primary objective was uh, in, in that time, you know, what we thought sound money. You know, you need to manage your money correctly so that the inflation shocks would be avoided. So that, you know, that would facilitate long-term investment because you reduce uncertainties about the inflation in the future. Too much inflation, but also too low inflation. That was the idea. Sound money is a key for economic development. And if you keep, you know, stabilization policy when you have a, a shock to pol politicians uh, by fiscal policy, it will lead to disasters for different things. One of the reasons was that the political business cycle is very different, different from, from the economic cycle. So you like to spend, of course, when there are elections to reduce taxes and all that, and not necessarily in the business cycle for stabilization purposes. Also, because of uh, lacks, you know, in the implementation of policies and all that, very often when you decide on an expansionary policy, if it's needed, 
the impact will come too late, you know, when uh, the economy has already recovered from the recessions. There are many reasons you can explain the political business cycle, but it reflected the mistrust in the stabilization role uh, of the government. So what is left for the government is quite important, of course. Ba basically, it is uh, allocation, you know, resources, structural reforms, think about structural changes. It has to do, you know, like education and all these things, uh, putting a framework, of course, for business to work, uh, social security, this redistribution, but not the stabilization function, which was kept minimum. So that was for the central bank, and the central bank would have the tools to do that. What were the tools to do that? Basically, the interest rate. When the economy goes bad, you lower the rates. You know, when the economy goes long, because there will be uh, pressures on inflation, downwards pressure when you're in a recession, and, and vice versa. The beauty of the construction, of course, uh, is that if all people, the market participants, the citizens, understand that the central bank would not tolerate you know, uh, the inflation or price pressures to go one way or the other, that would be internalized in the behavior. We had in the 60s and the 70s inflation experiences, which came from oil shock, so from, from excessive wages in some cases, uh, beyond productivity gains that you know, workers could make. And so inflation was basically driven by some supply shocks, you know, like the oil shock, or by a labor market development in some of the years like the, the late 60s and the 70s. It's very easy to, to understand when you have an external shock, like an oil shock, you know, oil prices go up. That means that if you consume a lot of oil, you are poor because you have to pay more, just work more to buy the same number of barrels of oil. And no, nobody likes it and everybody tries to push it to the other, the problem uh, of adjustment. That's how sometimes inflation emerges with a complacent central bank, of course, letting it go, and then you get, you know, instability of that. So when the central bank is fully credible, uh, the, the idea was that all the participants in the markets would internalize what we call the reaction function of the central bank, and they would uh, not misbehave. You know, when there is a shock, there will not be this game to try to push the problem to the other, and that's when inflation would emerge, of course, because there would be distributional problems and you know, a question of reallocation of resources and all that. And the central bank in the 60s and 70s was very often lenient in accommodating these shocks and all that. And then inflation expectations goes up, you know, and that creates, a, you know, unequal redistribution of wealth and, and income because some people can index, you know, their wages or their prices. Some others cannot because there are menu costs or fixed costs and all that. And it was very messy. So the consensus was, let's give that responsibility to the central bank clear mandate, technocrats, independent people, well-paid people, and, uh, and, uh, and you would achieve it. it. It worked pretty well, of course, and uh, what it, it worked pretty well, uh, up to a point, up to a point, because the world was changing, of course. And uh, what before, uh, and then we have to see what, what actually changed, actually. And one of the things that, that changed, actually, and these are sort of structural forces, uh, one of the things that changes really is uh, that what economists call the normal interest rate, the natural rate, start to fall. Interest rates start to fall. For demographic reasons, think about different reasons, demography, lower productivity. So the normal interest rate, you know, that a society would have, you know, like uh, European countries uh, with relatively low inflation, what would be the natural rate? the normal rate of interest, you know, for if there is no shock in the economy, no short-term shock in the economy, would, has fallen very much. Uh, estimates now of the normal rate are, uh, you know, zero in some countries, uh, 1%, 2% maximum in the US, not even 2% in the US. And uh, so if the normal rate is, is 0% and you have a shock, you know, a recession shock, what do you do? How can you lower the rates if there are zero? So the zero lower bound was, a, was a, something which was thought by academics before and also for, for, by the ECB. That's why the ECB tried to reach close to 2% and not 0% inflation so that the interest rates would be at least 2% you know, uh, in normal times because a little bit growth in the economy so would be around 2%, a little bit higher than 2%. So when there is a shock, you can still have some margin to lower the interest rate to support the economy. But uh, with fundamental forces, that's very much debated in economists, 
the normal rates fell to very low levels, close to zero. And so we have a shock, and especially a big shock as we had before. Uh, the central bank uh, has this, what we call the zero bound, the limit. And then the ECB, you know, I was part of that. We tried, I think it was in, uh, in 12, we tried to push the rates below zero and, uh, and, and, and we can discuss that later. But you try to, to test, you know, uh, what about negative rates and you go in other policies and basically the other policies try to influence other market prices. Basically, a central bank controls the short term rate. Uh, but via expectations, you know, what people think the central bank will do later influence the longer term rates. And if you buy assets, long term assets on the market by just creating money, which is amazing when you think about that, you take long term assets, you know, uh, you know, bonds, for example, issued by the government for 10 years maturity. You take that out of the market and you give short term, you know, uh, liquidity to the market in exchange. And by doing that, by taking your long-term bonds out of the market, you reduce long-term rates, which supports the economy. Now, at some points, you know, the central banks start to accumulate a big part of the public debt, you know, more than 20%. In some cases, you know, in some countries, more than 40% of public debt is in the books of the central banks. And it creates, of course, a, a relationship between the central bank, you know, and the separation ID, which I mentioned before, the central bank is dependent as a tools you create a lot of porosity between the central bank and the Ministry of Finance. Uh, for the time being, it works well, I would say, uh, this relationship works well with the COVID uh, because basically you have a negative shock on the economy, inflation pressures are down, and so the central bank wants to inject, you know, to support the economy, and governments wants to, you know, spend, you know, to support the economy. And so there is a lot of... Uh, you know, I would say honeymoon between the central bank and the ministries of finance. The question, of course, is at some point in time when inflation is things normalize, inflation goes up, will the central bank be dominated by, you know, fiscal consideration or not? And that's the fear you're, when you mention the German constitutional court and all that. That's the fear that many have, you know, uh, you know, there are so much intertwined, you know, between the central bank and the ministry of finance via the public debt that you own in the central bank that when things normalize, it's going to be quite difficult, you know, to get out of this. So that's one of the discussions. So one of the arguments was, look, the interest rates are close to zero. The central bank uh, has a mandate. Uh, he had difficulties in, in getting the inflation right before the COVID. And then you get the COVID shock, which comes in addition to that. So it's really, it's, it's really, and suddenly you go from what many call a change of regime, a change in paradigm, because the a central banker, you always had this mistrust vis-a-vis -vis ministers of finance. So that's a separation principle. We have a mandate, we have prices, we have our tools, and so we do our business. Uh, now the central bankers, like Christine Lagarde yesterday still, you know, at our seminar, central bankers seminar, they call, you know, for fiscal policy to support the economy. Uh, and that's, and the, the central bank basically would try to keep funding conditions for everybody, but also for government at very low rates. Uh, and so that's a change of, of paradigm. Pre-COVID crisis, you know, uh, we, uh, certainly my communication was that, you know, the central banks had, of course, this problem of low interest rates that, you know, what do you do when rates are zero? Uh, but I insisted very much on the nature of the shock. I always thought, you know, that in some shocks, the central bank cannot do much. So that's another argument, uh, which I thought we should have thought about earlier about fiscal policy than just because of this lower bond issue. For example, if you think, you know, there's going to be war tomorrow, uh, you can lower the rates as you want. It's not sure you're going to support spending, okay? So there are many cases like now, like the COVID, for example, you know, people, you lower the rates, maybe, you know, uh, people buy houses, you know, and, and the real estate works, of course. But uh, a lot of activities like investments will not be stimulated very much by lower rates. And uh, so uh, the nature of the shock, the nature of the shock is also a, a very important reasons why the environment has changed. And we had this, this succession of shocks, you know. You know which... It's not me, it's not me. We had this, uh... it's, uh... We had a succession of shock, and that's that's an element I think for the future 
we should uh, we should really think about. So the first shock was the global financial crisis, and we reacted. I said, uh, I think relatively well, but it's incompleted, unfortunately. So there are risks related to that, and uh, I think it's a key element of uh, fragility that we have, the incapacity to complete uh, the banking union and the capital market union. So we will come back to that in our discussion. The the second thing we have, and 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 that's where. You know, the uh, political scientists, the historians are extremely important in that, is that uh, suddenly this world vision that we had in Europe about uh, international cooperation, that international trade, you know, is a positive sum game, is a win-win, that the more, you know, countries develop economic relations, the more costly uh, wars would be, you know, or protectionism would be, you would shoot in your foot, you know, if you have barriers to trade or to exchanges in general, you know, to migration, whatever, but to international, you know, to globalization. And so the, the cost of deglobalization would be very high. And so uh, countries would be very careful, you know, uh, if they would go in protectionist policies or even limited, limiting, you know, skilled uh, migration and, 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 uh, and, and, and what you know. So this, this also paradigm, uh, which was, of course, uh, put in question long before the central bankers realized that, of course, by anti-globalists, <laughs> I must say, uh, these uh, forces became, of course, uh, very important and, and created a big uncertainty shock in the in the international community. And 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 Trump, of course, was off the just revealing a lot of these things and putting that in practice, and that was a shock uh, that uh, I think also the European Union was not very well prepared because you were used to the comfort of WTO, you know, multilateral organizations. You had the Washington consensus, you know, around, around the IMF. And so you had all these multilateral cooperation, which was there, uh, especially for central bankers that continue, I must say. Uh, but suddenly that's put into questions. And uh, also for other reasons that the way the economy was developing with network industries, you know, where you can have a natural monopolies, you know, where the winner takes all the gains, you know, and the, the development of network at the, at the international level, the question of uh, data, property, uh, the intellectual property, the role of China, of course, all these questions came uh, on the surface. They were there, but suddenly they came on the surface. And you see that uh, bargaining power, simply power in international relation become something very important. Europe had the tradition and of being very strong, actually, uh, in, standard, in, in trying to influence uh, international standards. I think they were influential in the Basel Committee on prudential standards. Uh, they were influential in uh, many other st standards like health standards, you know, norms and all that, because it's a big market. If you're a big market, you can influence uh, international standards, and let's not forget that the standards reflect, you know, your social so choices, your preferences. And so it's very important for your welfare, if you want to benefit from international trade, international relations, uh, that everybody, you know, follows more or less the rules of the game that where you have been very influential. Some people call it the Brussels effect, which uh, shows, you know, a very big power. It's not a negative uh, expression, it's a positive expression by saying that there you had a big influence in competition conditions. And that has been eroding, I think, over the years. Uh, and uh, and I, think that, I think we see that, for example, with the Brexit, it will be very important in, in financial matters. It will be very important uh, in climate, of course, that will be a key issue. Uh, what sort of standards you know, can you try to uh, impose, I could say, or influence at the world level? And uh, for that, you have to be very strong. Of course, the country can always decide to free ride and say, I will do it on my, I, I, my own, I will deviate from the standards, but uh, not everybody can free ride. And uh, if you want, if you think there is some form of, uh, you know, European preference or European sort of social model or sort of a European sort of uh, culture, uh, then of course, uh, you know, this European integration story is absolutely key. So you have uh, the way you can influence the rules of the game, uh, the standards internationally, and resist, of course, to power game or the winner takes all, you know, uh, in terms of definition of property rights and all these things. So I, I, that's the way I was teaching when I was very, very, very young, actually. And then it is true that over the years with the success of multilateral cooperation and all that, all these ideas start to 
to, 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 to go away and they came back forcefully, of course, first with the anti-globalist movements, of course, stressing the problems with globalization, the fact you cannot control your income distribution and, and many of the distribution aspects, but not only these, these aspects also, you know, the unfairness, you know, the, the social uh, competition, you know, based on social, uh, different social norms in different countries and all that. So I think uh, what we have with the COVID again uh, is a wake up call. Unfortunately, as I say, uh, Europe uh, reacts in crisis. Uh, I think we weakened too much our internal market uh, in uh, recent years. So there's a lot of things which, uh, you know, the internal market is not progress in financial services very much, I think. And uh, so we had this crisis, you know, this banking crisis, react. Capital market union is far from being completed and, and it goes on. I mean, the list is going on. I'm looking at the clock. So, so at, at, at this stage, uh, we had this COVID, and I think that's good to start the discussion on this. Uh, I think there's the realization uh, that uh, we had again an event which could lead to the disintegration of Europe and certainly of the monetary union. So that was understood by, I would say, all policymakers in Europe. And uh, you had this very rare a la Jean Monnet, you know, reaction, which is very often underestimated by the international community. You had uh, so much is at stake, you know, that uh, usually Europe reacts quite well, actually, in acute crisis situation. And that's very often underestimated. There is too much to lose. <coughs> it doesn't mean that it's good. Prevention would be better, of course, and better preparation. But I mean, the reaction has been pretty good, you know, from all authorities that collaborated very quickly. And I have also uh, taken all the flexibility that are needed to react to the crisis. The problems will come later, will be, you know, what are the lessons you draw from, from this shock? You have the recovery fund, for example. i just give an example. The recovery fund uh, was a pretty good reaction, but it really came because, I will not talk about panic, but really the, the, the acute, the extreme worry, the extreme concern that uh, the union could collapse, you know, after this shock, that some countries will not be able to stay in the monetary union. The spreads were st start, the interest rates, you know, in countries like Italy, but others will start to increasing very sharply uh, because uh, as always some countries are stronger than other countries. And some of the weakest countries, of course, were more exposed to the COVID because of tourism and other sort of activities. And so, uh, but the reaction was pretty good, but the reaction was for a temporary shock uh, that's the first thing. So it's something that you can stretch over time. Now that we have a second wave, you know, you still think you can, you can, you can stretch it, or you, you can. You, you, there are many discussions in the ECB to see how much, how far can you go in supporting spreads, you know, and ensuring that the monetary conditions are transmitted in all jurisdictions, which is totally new compared to the time when I was there. When Christine Lagarde says we want to ensure that our easy monetary conditions are transmitted everywhere, uh, you know, Mario Draghi did it indirectly with the whatever it takes. Uh, but that was subject, you know, to a whole framework of condi conditionality under ESM uh, and this was conditionality, all this. While now, uh, because the shock is exogenous, so it's not your responsibility, uh, there is a goodwill, you know, political goodwill to say, look, uh, we can do this. There will be solidarity, uh, but it's temporary. And, uh, and that will be the big question for the future. To what extent can we uh, incorporate some of the elements, you know, we call it now fiscal capacity in the framework. I think there is a good consensus to say that if it's an exogenous shock as the one we had, it's OK. Uh, if it's uh, not an exogenous shock, that means that it's because you mismanage your economy or your political system doesn't work, uh, that you need, you know, to have transfer from the others, uh, that I think will be quite difficult. So that will be a tough discussion for the future. The other point that you also have here uh, with this recovery fund uh, is will country, there is a lot of money actually uh, for some countries. The, 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 and so I think this is remarkable. But the discussion in town now is to see how is this money going to be spent? You know, there is a lot of absorption capacity. Money very often is there, but you don't, don't have the projects, you know, to, to use that money. Uh, and the second, basically, as everybody is looking, especially from the northern country, is to say is this, this money that you are going to use in some countries is going to be used, you know, to increase, you know, your productivity, to improve, you know, 
the economy and uh, try to reduce the real divergence that we have known since years now in the European Union, in the monetary union in particular. And uh, so uh, depending on the experience we have with the recovery fund, I think the outcomes can be very different. I know that in some countries, all the governance, the governance of the way you spend the grants will be key and how the decision is going to be taken and what will be the result. You can imagine many scenarios where the money is misused. For example, you could say, you know, I had a big project, you know, in climate or in digitalization in a country uh, on my national budget. I will stop to budget that. I will just make it pay for Europe, which is fine. And you use the money uh, for something else, like, for example, uh, pure transfers that would not improve fundamentally, you know, the uh, structural, you know, elements of your economy, for example. So there will be a lot of political uh, discussion and the intrusion uh, about the way this money is being spent. Uh, and the ECB, the central bank, and just to finish with that, the central bank is not the only game in town, which is good, as it was before. The central bank is now obviously supporting a huge fiscal expansion by its purchase program, but it's temporary, trying to ensure that conditions. But you could imagine, for example, when things start to normalize, that income and wealth distribution within some countries, because uh, there has been a huge increase of inequalities in this shock again, again. And uh, so you can imagine that the political consensus within countries is going to be difficult in the coming years in some countries. No people more or less unite because the shock is there and everybody more or less agree. Uh, but once the things start to go better, uh, because public debt will have increased by something like 20 percentage points of GDP, and they increased already by 20 percentage points of GDP in the previous shock. So at some point, you know, these distributional questions will come to the fore. And then, uh, you know, policymakers like the ECB will have to say, well, if there is an increase of interest rate in one country, uh, because of political problems, what is the central bank going to do? Because uh, now the central bank says, well, I can intervene because, you know, there is an exogenous shock, uh, what we call non-fundamental widening of spreads of interest rate, non-fundamental re related. If you have a political shock or another sort of shock, uh, then the discussion will be there. And we better prepare for that. So I plead very much in general to improve very much the governance of the area, to start to think about these situations that may occur. And uh, there are different ways. I saw in the questions from the students, you have, what about the European Monetary Fund? What about the ESM? How should, could it evolve? Can you do it uh, you know, for a limited number of countries? Because the problems of the monetary union are more acute than if you have some uh, flexibility via your own monetary policy in other countries. Uh, these are very difficult questions. I still believe that the community, the méthode communautaire remains essential, but I must also admit that the more countries you have, the more they're different, heterogeneous, and the more, uh, the more difficult it is, uh, because the monetary union is really a different regime, of course, from those who are not in the monetary union. Uh, so uh, that's a little bit where in between we try to accommodate both, you know, do things for the monetary union, and you have seen for the recovery fund, one way to solve the problem was to increase the overall envelope also for the non-members of the monetary union, so the member of the monetary union would receive a substantial amount, you know, of the uh, grants envelope, uh, so that you could deal both, you know, from the uh, old problems of co cohesion, you know, the, from the new member states, and also from the particular problems of the member of the union. But it's extremely complex, you know, to manage at the political level, this, at the institutional and political level, these sort of issues. So uh, it's going to remain. But the remarkable thing, just the conclusion, it is true that the capacity to react, you know, and to innovate has been remarkable. But also that's on the positive side. On the negative side is usually when things normalize, then you go backwards and you, 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 you let the work unfinished and until the next shock. And this is a dangerous game because at some point, you know, some countries may say, I better do it alone. I love the European Union, but, you know, sometimes, you know, I, I, I want to regain sovereignty. Things about Brexit. I want to regain sovereignty because I think I can do it better. I'm not necessarily against, you know, Europe or globalization, but I need it's too slow. You know, uh, it's not in the direction I want to go. So I want to regain. Obviously, not everybody can do that because everybody would lose. Uh, and we can discuss Brexit. So let, let me stop here. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Peter Brad, for this fascinating presentation. Without further ado, I give the floor to Antoine Vaucher for his reaction and question. Thank you, merci. Um, I, I would like to say as well that I'm very pleased to be to be here to, tonight and and um, I'm very grateful to, 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 to the Institut d'études européennes to have invited me over for this very interesting discussion and to this prestigious moment of the academic year. So um, again, um, uh, just like Peter Pret, I'm, I'm very um, uh, attached to the to the Institut d'études européennes. Of course, I've not been teaching there before, but I've been studying it in previous research of mine, and I've always been. Uh, impressed by its role as a sort of a crossroads, and of course, of disciplines, but also of intellectual approaches uh, from a variety um, of places. And so it's it's a very it's a place that is very wel welcoming, um, intellectually speaking, and I think this has a very um, very particular value. Um, I, 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 I'm, you know, I'm, as a political scientist, I mean, I will react as a political scientist, uh, of course, uh, as I am. Um, and not as a, as an economist, which I am not. Um, I, I I would like to stress, you know, what first of all, what the crisis has uh, somehow changed, what the crisis has uh, you know transformed, and and then raise a number of questions that somehow could could be also uh, questions to uh, Peter Pret. So, what is uh, of course quite striking for a political scientist is that uh, a number um, of issues um, that um, previously were considered to be di difficult to discuss or that were somehow uh, deadlocks of uh, EU political discussion um, have somehow uh, been uh, unlocked in the context uh, of the crisis. I think in a way what could be said is that somehow the crisis has forced politics back into uh, the discussion um, of, uh, on the, on, of the uh, European uh, Union. I think, for example, uh, in the context of the crisis, and especially you know, to, rate, you know, to address the issues of the crisis, we have found margins of maneuvering within the treaties, of course, by suspending temporarily uh, the uh, Growth and Stability Pact, by uh, flexibilizing uh, the competition policy rules. And also we have at the same time not only found degrees of freedom in the treaties, and I think it's important because often the, the discussion, uh, speaking also as a French in 2005 in the referendum you know, on the constitutional treaty, part of the discussion was that you know, we were stuck somehow constrained by the marble of the treaties, as we say, le marbre des traités uh, in French. And, and here, I think it's interesting to see that in moments of crisis, um, there is a, cap a capacity of flexibility of the treaties and a capacity to react. Um, to that should be also added the fact that, uh, contrarily to the 2008 uh, crisis, um, or somehow we have, you know, that mm, drawn the lessons from the 2008 and 10 uh, crisis. Um, it's striking to see that uh, we have come out with a sort of contra-cyclical uh, and coordinated uh, response um, to the crisis. So in a way that that is, of course, in in in, in sharp difference with the 2008 and uh, uh, austerity uh, policies that were thought as the response to uh, the, the, the crisis. Um, so I think this is one element uh, that is that is uh, quite striking. And of course, uh, the question of mutualizing debt, the, the question of uh, direct subsidies in support of um, uh, the, the, the states that have been hit mostly by the COVID is uh, of importance, of course, in that context. Um, um, I think when I say politics is 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 has as you know made its way back in the game, um, I'm thinking also uh, uh, about the fact that um, the discussion has happened in a way much more out in the open. I, I remember for me one of the important moment of this crisis was 
in March when the Spanish uh, Prime Minister Sanchez, Sanchez came out with uh, a plan of recovery, uh, for recovery, sort of what he called the Mar Marshall Plan for Europe. Um, and that uh, was in open disagreement with other member states, uh, which actually uh, constituted the Frugal Four um, coalition, uh, while the Spanish and then later with Italian government and other governments have come out with a, a letter to uh, Charles Michel of, I think, if I remember, seven uh, governments. I think it's interesting because the the in a way the politics has has gone out in the open because uh, the previous crisis the discussion was much more within the remit and the, the of the Eurogroup and uh, somehow the discussions had remained somehow um, uh, not not public. Here we have a discussion and the framing of the discussion has emerged thanks to that around the issue of solidarity. How do we want to deal with the, the issue of solidarity? And um, in that sense, I think uh, we can say that you know, somehow um, uh, politics has, has, has uh, made its way and reopened. And in a way, it's the first time it has done so ever since the Brexit. So I think it's important to, uh, you know, to look at that moment in that sense, in a way, as, an, as a first, a first answer to um, uh, the issue uh, of, to the post-Brexit situation of, uh, of Europe. Um, so the question is uh, from this uh, recovery plan that has emerged uh, as a sort of uh, outcome of all these discussions, um, there is a number of, of, of questions from, from that. Um, first is, what is this politics that I have, I'm describing very schematically um uh, well or i mean um does this politics has have um um uh, uh, an adjusted institutional framework i mean part of the discussion has still happened in intergovernmental um settings um so when it comes to um address conflicts then in part of are also um, about conflicts of distribution, uh, is the discussion in intergovernmental settings, such as the Eurogroup of the European Summit, the best uh, or the most uh, in fitted uh, institutional framework? Um, I think the way the deal was made late July has showed us that, you know, the sort of rebate to Netherlands, cut in the research fund, sort of, you know, comprom last minute compromise is, of course, uh, um, a problem, but also because I think it's when it comes to 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 build transnational political compromises, uh, probably this these intergovernmental uh, settings are, uh, don't um, are not necessarily the best uh, solution, also because they create necessarily a politics of um, of shaming, of blaming uh, of states one against the other. And of course, each time we see stere national stereotypes re, uh, come back in the political discussion. And of course, um, when we think of a genuine fiscal union for the, for the European Union, I guess uh, it's not a union country by country. Uh, it would be more a union where the issue of inequality or the issue of redistribution would be dealt with at the uh, EU level uh, more than just country by country, because otherwise immediately the question of the juste retour, uh, the just return immediately emerges. And as Peter Pratt was saying, of course, countries are already watching each other uh, as to how the money will be spent and already somehow as starting to blame blaming each other uh, on the way it has been spent well spent or not well spent so uh, my my first point is about this uh, question of uh, institutional framework and um, a, a, and how it is adjusted uh, to um, the challenge of the moment my second question is i mean point is 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 uh, about the, the the magnitude of the crisis. I mean, is that enough? Um, is that enough uh, a recovery plan? 
um, given, again, the magnitude of the crisis, not only exclusively right now, but that so many people expect or anticipate in terms of social and economic, uh, you know, distress. Um, uh, are we offering, you know, a, a, a plan that is really addressing issues of, uh, of all the inequalities that will, of course, emerge from the crisis in terms of younger generations, in terms of disemployment, uh, uh, lower middle class or, uh, or working class uh, issues? So I'm addressing this because, uh, of course, one of the issues is of also, you know, uh, to what extent uh, uh this you know the discussion um to to what extent the countries that will be hit the most uh have the margin of maneuvering to address the social and economic crisis that will come out of the of the of the of this moment and that last uh, and last issue uh question is of course how transformative will this moment be uh in terms uh, of uh, paradigms in the European Union. Um, the, so there are many questions, uh, maybe others, I mean, I will address some probably as the discussion unfolds. So I will just stick to to what Peter Pret is most, uh, I mean, has advanced most on uh, is on central banking. Um, the, of course, the European Central Bank has expanded cr critically its role, um, the paradigm as you were saying, of independence that was initially emerged in, in the 1990s. Um, and the, the, in a way, the institution has been so efficient that it's been given more and more responsibilities as the crisis has unfolded, and it has become not only a monetary institution, but also a regulator of, in the banking union, somehow an executive institution in the Troika, uh, a chief expert, uh, economic expert in 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 the, in the context of the, um, you know, of, course, of the, the eurozone, and the question is now, at the same time that the, its initial mandate of price stability is not as central, um, it's not as pressing as it used to be, so the question is what in a way, um, what is the limit of action of central banks uh, today? Um, what is the democratic risk of having a mandate that is in so in a way now so restrict you know somehow um, somehow too uh, restrictive given you know the many functions that the the central banks are, are playing? Um, I remember hearing Tony Negri, the Italian philosopher, saying you know the central banks are the new winter palaces. So uh, my my question is so what what would be today you know um, the proper role of central banks and the political basis in a way the democratic ground also for such a, an ex, an extended uh, role um, in the new in the new context so that's a question of course about the new paradigms the new paradigm for central banking that could come out of the crisis and I, I stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, thank you, Antoine. Uh, maybe, P Peter, could you answer to some of your uh, questions from uh, 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 Professor Vaucher, and then we, we can continue with the questions from uh, we, we received by, by email. Yeah, uh, thank you, Antoine. These are excellent points. Uh, I, would have, I would have added maybe uh, the fact that uh, one realizes at the political level uh, that uh, the separation between geopolitics and uh, economics is gone. You know that was an illusion of many people that you could. You know uh, I mentioned that in my in my points. So that means that uh, if you think about the currency, for example, and, and you know what I mean with the weaponization of the dollar, uh, because the dollar, you know, because it's always a triangle when you deal with currencies, you have to go via the dollar, even if you want to buy. You know, a Korean won, you know, from Euro, you go via the dollar. So there's a triangle always in the international monetary system. And uh, so that means that they can capture in the US uh, uh, most of the transactions, actually, and, and, and trace the transactions and, and submit that, you know, to their political preferences and essential. That's one an example, but there are many examples, you know, in foreign direct investment, you know, the role of China, etc. So 
I mean, we don't have the time to talk about this, but I think one of the, the main change that you have, that's not so much my topic, except for the currency I mentioned before. Uh, that's why the, 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 the central bank has come with the, the, the central bank digital currency. Uh, that's maybe one way to get around, you know, this, this weaponization of the dollar, which goes very often via correspondent banking. It's a bit technical, but, but there is something very political behind that. Uh, and uh, FDI, you know, and the role of China, the US, you know, what we call the strategic autonomy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All these domains now, I think, uh, means that the political, the political union, inc including, including defense, you know, as we have seen uh, with uh, Trump, you know, because Trump, <laughs> I don't think will be back in four years, but I mean, uh, almost 40%, 50% of the US population are supported someone, you know, who was against NATO and, and international cooperation, actually, and a, a sort of zero-sum gain sort of mentality. And so we should be very careful that, uh, you know, the fact that you have a change in the U.S. administration uh, will, uh, will uh, may, there will be an improvement, of course, but we should be prepared. That, that, that's also what I in, in mind with the, with the text, you know, so the things, things probably will go better with the new president, uh, but, you know, there is, there is a change of regime also, I think, and we should be prepared for a much more political union. And that's not my field, but I thought in monetary. The, the, the other point, the, the first point you made, uh, Antoine, a very good point, is uh, thanks to the crisis, uh, now there are many things we, we, we didn't want to even look at that because there is a treaty, there are rules, you know, and the, I would basically be careful about that because uh, what brought the unity is uh, two things. I mean, first, it's a severe exogenous shock. <laughs> so it's, it's not our responsibility, it just come from like an earthquake. But, you know, even you think about a dramatic, you know, earthquake event, you could say that the country has not been prepared for that. So the old building destroyed, and then you ask, you know, for support from the other countries, because, you know, half of your country has been destroyed by an earthquake. And, and, and so the other countries would say, Look, you know, we invested a lot, you know, in resilience for, you know, any event, you know, we may not have earthquakes, but we may have floods or other things, and you didn't care. And so, you know, solidarity is fine, but only for exogenous shock, you know, in healthcare, you, in the beginning of the healthcare, people are looking at Italy and say, oh, no wonder it's Italy uh, that it comes there. And then we saw other <laughs> countries got it as well and, and did do, do better. And uh, Italy then did it better than the others, et cetera, et cetera. But um, or Greece did it better from the beginning. So the question of exogenous, endogenous shock is a, is a terrible thing uh, because you always have responsibility. You can have an earthquake, but you are unprepared for that. You can have a cyber shock, which I thought would be the shock we would live now, a cyber attack, you know, of major dimension in the world. And we were starting preparing to that, you know, I think that... Uh, we were preparing to that. We had the terrorism also, you know, so there are a lot of things we do. Uh, but this distinction between exo and endo is, uh, is quite delicate. I just take my domain. The ECB says, I want to go against uh, non-fundamental widening of spreads, you know, when Italian rates or Spanish rates go up in the COVID shock, they intervene specifically, which is for me, in my, my period, inconceivable. We, we would not think about that. We would think about conditionality, we think about the political framework and all that, like the OMT of, you know, after Mario Draghi, whatever it takes. We have the OMT, you know, and with the ESM role and all that. Uh, so here, uh, there was a full agreement, including at the political level for what the ECB was doing. Uh, it's an exogenous shock. It's not the responsibility. So there is no moral hazard. Uh, and so we do it. Now with the transfers, uh, that's quite an achievement. It's quite, it's quite a lot of money for some countries if it's well used. And uh, you're absolutely right. The governance of the recovery fund will be absolutely key for the future of Europe. So the way you do it politically. Uh, so here, the basic idea, if I, I understand, is to look at, you know, the country specific recommendation in the, the framework of the MIP, you know, and identifying, you know, structural weaknesses in the country. So it's not to support demand, you know, the recovery fund. It's basically to address the supply, including divergences, you know, and, 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 and making the economies more resilient, adapting, you know, to climate, accelerating the, the digitalization and all these things. 
So it's more structural. The way it's, the money is going to be spent will be key. Uh, and I don't know how the governance will work. That's not my domain. But you're absolutely right that this is going to be absolutely a, a, key, a key element in, in the coming period. Uh, I give you just one extremely little example which has been commented in the press. You know that uh, it's not only the grants, uh, the, but also there is a borrowing capacity, which I think is quite important to have a, a European safe asset, you know, and not a German safe asset or a French safe asset and a not so safe asset for some other countries. So uh, a European borrowing, which is quite sizable uh, on paper in the agreement, uh, I think is a major development potentially again. So I think it's a good decision. But when some countries say, you know, thanks to the ECB, pushing the rates low. I don't see really the need to go via a European instrument, which gives me a very slightly uh, advantage, financial advantage. I don't need to do that. I, I think this is, uh, one has to be careful about this. Uh, no, I, this, this has been commented in the press, you know. Uh, so I think this, uh, we should not overreact to, to what we read, but it is clear that this money is there to be borrowed. Uh, no, not for 20 and maybe not much for 21 because it's basically for 22, 23 and looking beyond. But it's, a, it's absolutely key that the countries which, you know, uh, are more fragile uh, benefit from uh, European borrowing. I think it's quite important for the, for the capital market in general, but for the whole cohesion of the union as well. Uh, and uh, so that's a little example. But you're right on the, on the what is EXO, what is ENDO? And how are you going to deal with that? It's highly political level. And uh, the commission plays a very important role in identifying, you know, what is good and what is bad, given the priorities, climate, digitalization, and, and some other things, but basically these two priorities. The, 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 the other point uh, there is, um, uh, you, the second point you made, uh, is there enough money? I will see after. But the third point was, is it sufficiently transformative? So that these are the reforms. Um, now, it is the the um, the trend is to say climate. So big part in climate, which I think is good. That means that you prevent. You know, you know that it's already late, but you have to do these things. But the worry, of course, with climate investment is that it does not necessarily increase the productivity of the country. Because you have to bring new technology, you have to scrap, you know, old technologies. So in the longer run, I think it's good for productivity in general. But for a number of years, you know, your, some capital will be obsolete and the productivity tends to go down when you do these things aggressively, of course. Now, depends on the degree of adaptability of the country and all this. But uh, the question about the rate of growth, you know, potential growth of Europe is a scary issue. Because after the global, before the global financial crisis, you have a slowdown of productivity worldwide in many, even in developing countries. So the potential growth goes down. Uh, after the global financial crisis, it's went down further. Uh, we're not talking about big figures, but I mean, it's already low. So you go even lower. And after all big recessions like the one, uh, it's probably productivity is going to slow down further. Uh, and... Uh, Except, you know, if you start to, to rebuild, you know, to, 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 to facilitate innovation, you know, and, and all that, which is the recovery plan of the Commission. But the climate story uh, and productivity uh, is quite difficult to reconciliate uh, for if you look at the next three, four years. If you don't succeed in having a relatively higher growth rates, that sustainability is going to be quite difficult because even if interest rates are low, uh, if the rate of growth of the economy goes lower, as many people think, for a number of years. Uh, you can say, ah, good news, interest rates are very low, but public debt are very high, much higher, and the rate of growth of the economy is, is quite uncertain. So we may go back, you know, very easily, as I said before, to shocks within the, un the union, financial shocks in the union, when things start to normalize paradoxically. And that would be very difficult. And, and you mentioned before, Antoine, that Domestic income distribution problems may be the trigger at some point that you get, you know, political problems within some countries, difficulties, you know, to, to decide, you know, who's going to foot the bill of all that, you know, making the rich pay, uh, you know, uh, uh, some sizable part of, of, of that. 
it is clear uh, the ECB will be there to say, well, inflation, uh, don't uh, dream that inflation is going to <clears throat> uh, solve the problem of public, public debt. First, it's difficult to engineer. It will be very difficult to decide, you know, how you do that. Having a little bit more inflation would be good, of course, but it's very difficult to engineer. We, uh, we struggle with that at the central bank to get a bit more inflation. Uh, so uh, the question of sustainability of debt will be an issue uh, when things. Nobody wants to talk. And then you say at the same time, that was your second point. Is there enough money to do all this? Well, yes, debts are already very high. Uh, also because GDP has been lower. Uh, interest rates are lower. The ECB will continue as long as there is no inflation. Uh, which is the likely scenario for the coming years. But as you say, uh, the transformation needs are huge. And if you take a country like Italy, uh, it is clear that the slowdown of productivity uh, is a long, long-term uh, issue. It's not, uh, it's not the, after the global financial crisis. It was well before that. And so the, the, the question about moral hazard, uh, you know, uh, we are ready to help. Uh, if there is an earthquake, you know, uh, but there are limits. Uh, and uh, even if you give you uh, money, you know, to rebuild, there is a lot that can go in corruption, you know, uh, in uh, overpriced buildings that are not resilient. That, you know, these questions. So the, all this governance of the, that money. I think it's sizable money. If it's well used, there will be uh, extremely important effects. How can we build uh, for the future? I think it will depend on the success of uh, how the money is used. So it's, uh, it's what everybody now is looking. But don't forget the other points about the environment of Europe uh, requires much more political integration in Europe because uh, all the tools that you have, like trade, you know, trade, competition policy, you know, state aid, all these tools, you know, you said internally we use that in a flexible way, which was fine. Uh, and you have to see how you, you exit from that at some point so that, you know, the German, German firms benefited much more uh, from uh, state aid than some other countries uh, because they had more fiscal capacity at the German level. So there will be issues there. But the, the external aspect, not mentioning Brexit, but the US and China will be key issues. So you, 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 you will be absolutely pushed into more political union and uh, weaponizing, you know, the tools you have. And that will be difficult. I have, we haven't discussed migration, which is another issue. Uh, okay, th thank you, uh, both of us, for your uh, uh, intervention. Um, thank you for this uh, insightful presentation also. Uh, now we will continue with two rounds of questions, uh, which in many ways uh, will spin out the, the debate. Um, as announced, uh, we will give priority to the question uh, received in advance from the audience. And after that, we will, if we have time, we will continue with the question raised during uh, the conference. Uh, we took the liberty to organize uh, the questions around three main and uh, overlapping themes. Uh, firstly, the question of European fiscal capacity and the boundaries of European solidarity was addressed to uh, our guest today. Um, debates questioning the question of uh, a, a European Minister of Finance, how to prevent and not to heal European crisis, uh, what kind of mechanism of solidarity could be displayed, what kind of fiscal tools could be developed also, what well, that's this kind of uh, general question raised, and all of them uh, are uh, quite related to the Brexit uh, situation and, of course, of the COVID crisis. Uh, the second topic is related uh, to the famous crisis relaunch process of European integration uh, you have mentioned in your speech. Uh, indeed, some participants ask what kind of relaunch we could expect, what kind of new governance could take place after the crisis, uh, in a kind of a, an optimistic way, in some, in some way. Uh, uh, what appears also is the old idea to maybe deepen the European integration process among a smaller group of states with a new transfer of national prerogative, as I say in French, l'Europe à deux vitesses. Uh, and, and finally, a third group of interventions are connected to the, how do you say that, to the, maybe to the neoliberal model and to the idea of, I don't know, how the last crisis could trigger the development of a new economic model at the European uh, level. Uh, or maybe this uh, crisis, uh, all these themes are really quite um, related. All these crises could be, you know, a new impetus uh, for a new European model, a new recovery plan. But 
wider than that, a new economic project gathering, you know, environmental issue, uh, problem of, crest, of, uh, of growth, economic growth, and health issue, of course. So this really three um, important uh, questions, but really overlapping a team. Uh, so if you have uh, any comments about that, I think our audience will be really uh, pleased by, by, by some elements that you have already mentioned during your uh, previous speech. So I'll leave the room to, 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 to both of you. Maybe... Uh, you can say, Antoine, but... <laughs> or Antoine. Not, uh... Both. Um, no, but there are many, there are many questions, so I, I, um, I will stick to a couple of them. But um, um, I think one, <clears throat> I mean, I, I, mean I, I, I insisted in my little uh, intervention on, on, you know, how politics had, had opened, you know, somehow a new, um, uh, new margins of maneuvering and um, reopened the discussion uh, on, on the issue of solidarity um, and you know the, the institutional mechanisms to, to solidarity. Um, <clears throat> but of course, um, you know these moments of uh, crisis or where things seem to be rethought and uh, paradigms seem to be uh, up to you know redefinition. Are uh, <clears throat> um, you know they 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 they're not completely new and I mean they don't start from scratch and to a certain extent I mean if you think of the recovery plan what is interesting is how it is it has been progressively taken into and it will probably be taken into the European semester so in a way uh, there is there you know there, there is a center of gravity in the European Union. The center of gravity ever since the Maastricht Treaty has been ever more the the, the European Semester as a sort of big umbrella of uh, surveillance and uh, uh, convergence of policies. Um, and of course, this umbrella um, is has a sort of attraction force that is quite impressive um, uh, today. But Pretty much the way the single market had uh, before Maastricht, in a way. Um, but there are issues around that. I think they think they can figure out two issues about this gravity um, of the European semester. The first is, of course, the, the, the European semester was built for um, to push for structural reforms. Uh, to what extent is that uh, well, or you know, is is that the the, the best? Um, framework to uh, think for um, the social and the environmental challenges. Um, so far, the scoreboards are very poor in terms of social issues and indicators, and of course, also in terms of greening. Your mic, your mic has been cut. Uh, oh, sorry. Time. I don't know. Is, is that is that? It's back. It's back. No, it works. Okay. Uh, oh, I hope it was not for too long. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. No, no. <laughs> No, no. So, I mean, the question is, to what extent is is it fit and equipped to address uh, the challenge of of of, of um, social social I mean, uh, of social inclusion of uh, and of greening EU policies? The second challenge of it is of, is also the issue of uh, democratic accountability, and um, it, it it is. Uh, I mean, I've been writing, uh, and others, uh, Amona also has been writing on that. I mean, there's. There's an issue of, of course, the European Parliament remains very much the, not a, not even a junior partner in that story. It's very much marginal in the game, and in the European Recovery Plan as well. I mean, for the the legal basis that was chosen for the Recovery Plan puts the European Parliament very much at the margin of the discussion. So the I mean, I'm I'm, I'm raising typically political science issues is, but I think in, when we're talking about the governance, so uh, the question is. Of course, when you trans, you know, reforms of Europe are always taken into stabilic, um, automatic stabilizers in a way, and and uh, and the European semester is one. You know, um, there is a push for change, but there is also um, path dependency uh, in terms of instruments, in terms of accountability, and of course, the more you give uh, powers to this European semester, the more the question of accountability. Uh, is uh, is um, will be will be open. Uh, well, I'm I'm stopping here because otherwise it would be too long. So, 
So on the question of uh, fiscal in general, the Minister of Finance and Solidarity, um, there are different aspects, of course. One, um, when you think about uh, the European Union decides to borrow a lot of money, frankly, to borrow, which is you know new, uh, seven years, almost zero rates, zero percent, uh, and the reimbursement will come after. And uh, today, you don't know exactly uh, how you're going to uh, finance the reimbursement. Uh, fortunately, the interest rates will be you know close to zero or. And so, uh, so, but still, you have to reimburse the money. And uh, so, the reimbursement will come later. Now, uh, you, it is being said, you know, that you're going to explore, you know, new European tax base, you know, uh, you know, taxing, you know, the, in the multinational network industries and things like this. And if you cannot do that, of course, you have to go back to the contributions of the, the national countries. I think the question uh, of Europe to have a, a taxation base, a broader taxation base is key. Uh, I think uh, the question of taxation uh, is an international question, not only a European question. Uh, when we talk about corporate taxes and tax, um, I will not say avoidance, uh, but the, the fact that, uh, you know, within the European Union, there have been very interesting figures saying, you know, uh, Ireland, you know, uh, the contribution, <laughs> contribution uh, of uh, some multinational network industry in terms of corporate taxes, how much they pay uh, in a particular country, or the Netherlands, for example. I think that problem has to be solved. And I don't know if you saw that, but in the preparatory discussions around Biden in the US, it seems to be the willingness to address also this question about corporate taxation international, uh, because the US also, you know, has the tax paradise and all that. and uh, But I think with the network in industries uh, that we know, uh, it is a major problem. And so I think if Europe is strong, if you have a more cooperative US uh, administration, uh, I think it would be key as a sort of, uh, first to, to clean the mess within, within the union, but also internationally, because that's where you can regain some uh, tax uh, taxation uh, capacity actually. Uh, so I don't think so much about transaction tax on capital movements. I think that would be very difficult. Well, who knows? But I, I, I don't be, believe. But I think you know, on corporate taxes, I mean, there must be there must be uh, uh, possibilities there. So I think the the taxation capacity. The second is when you do that, of course, uh, if you increase, there are of course distributional effect, of course, because you are poor, you you pay lesser than if you are rich, and uh, the VAT would not be very progressive enough, uh, of course. Uh, tax, of course, you have a poor country, another a richer country, it makes a difference, of course. But I mean, the, the distributional part of uh, taxation, I think, should be increased. So the size, uh, but also the distributional aspect, the proportionality, if I can say, of, of contributions that you have should be. And, and you should do it in a way that people don't, the citizens don't notice too much in their day to day life. Of course, there is a democratic story. And some may exploit, you know, the fact that you, the just a retour that you mentioned before. But I think there we have to, and looking into the sort of multinationals where the tax base erosion is a fact, you know, since many years now and accelerating is something that uh, it's a top priority. So that, that's one. The solidarity, what's, what worries me very much is that we say solid, solidarity means also responsibility which is true, I mean, uh, and so it's normal also that if you contribute and you transfer, that you have a look about what is being done with the money. I think that's normal. But as Antoine was saying, uh, how do you design institutions, democratic institutions that do it in such a diverse landscape, you know, and such uh, uh, a very institutionally and politically complicated environment. So uh, that's, uh, that's not for me, uh, fortunately. Uh, having a minister of finance, uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, what would he do? But I think, uh, yes, probably would be good to have someone like this. Uh, first, because it's important in international relations to have one, one person, you know, that could represent, you know, uh, the colleagues. You know, we have the president of the Eurogroup, you know, uh, participating to international meeting. Uh, but, I mean, you can formalize it further, you know, in sort of... Uh, full-time job or something close to full-time job detached from the national. I don't know, but there are, ways, there are ways to improve that. You could also 
I think, improve the debt management, public debt management at the European level. I think it's key to have a, a sort of safe asset at the European level. So that's a key priority. It's very political, of course, because to what extent do you mutualize the province of the old public debt? I think what has done with the recovery fund, and if you go a bit further, if, if the experience prove, prove a positive, uh, you can go further and have some, uh, uh, for, you know, for example, the financing of public goods uh, or the collection you know, of uh, multinational you know, sort of tax base. Uh, I think uh, there you could, you could increase a little bit the, the capacity for maybe a few percentage points of GDP, which is not small.
uh, to all of us um, for, for this evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.